Hey, Grace Point. It's good to be with you this morning through a different means. I would much rather be there in person, but uh, I'm honored to be sharing the word with you this morning. And I just want you to know that uh, we miss you guys. We love you guys so much. We talk about you um, all the time to people here in Colorado. And uh, everyone knows that when we talk about our church, that we're referring to Grace Point in Georgetown, Kentucky. So, um, you guys are just a blessing to us. There are times when I can literally feel your prayers and your support. And I just thank you so much for that. God is doing wonderful things here uh, for us as a family, for me. Uh, and we, we just got some awesome opportunities coming up that we look forward to sharing with you soon. And uh, so, yeah, I'm just excited to share the word with you guys today. And so I hope you're ready. Um, you know that you're going to get a lot of word because I've been bubbling up for like six months now. So, uh, so here we go. Um, I know Jeremiah just began a, a, a series on condemnation. And um, although I'm not going to minister on condemnation, when he shared with me um, recently that he was going to begin that series, I began to just, just evaluate my own life and, and, and begin to meditate some on condemnation and, and the power that it once held on my life. And as I began to meditate on that and think about that, something, something powerful hit me. And that is that I can honestly say I live a condemnation-free life. And, and don't throw stones, don't feel condemnation that I'm sharing that. Because I don't, when I say that, I don't mean that condemnation never comes. I don't mean that I'm never attacked with condemnation, that I never have condemning thoughts. But I have learned in my life to recognize that voice and to, to pull it down and to get it out of my life immediately. And, um, you know, so, so, but when I began to think about that, when I had that thought, I, I, I remembered when a time in my life, you know, for most of my Christian life, um, when I did live with condemnation. And, and I tried to think back and I thought, what was the revelation that I received that I can say eradicated condemnation from my life? And as I began to, to think about that, it was, it was, easily, it was easy to remember the, the revelation, the teaching that changed my life and got rid of condemnation. And uh, because, you know, so many times we think of condemnation, we think it's that we have to um, erase these thoughts and memories of things we've did in the past or, you know, there's a lot of things. But what I actually, one of the things that, the thing that got condemnation out of my life was when I realized that a particular thing I was doing um, in my prayer time with the Lord was a dead work. And when I recognized that it was a dead work, now, what's a dead work? A dead work, there, there are dead works and there are good works. A dead work is that work which we do to atone for sin or to make things right with God. And the, the dead work that I had in my life that was opening the door to condemnation was actually the confession of sins for forgiveness. Um, it, it, it's powerful now to think back um, you know, I know Keisha and I, every night when we would pray together, we would begin each prayer by just saying, Lord, I, I, I know we've sinned today. I don't know exactly where we sinned, but we're dirty, rotten sinners, so we know we sinned somewhere. So we just ask that you forgive us of all of our sins and, and erase our sins, and, and we're sorry. And, you know, and then we would go forth with our prayers. And... When I was first getting a hold of grace and new covenant, the, the, one of the most powerful revelations that I received from that was that we have been forgiven of all sins, past, present, and future. And that's a whole lesson for another day. But, and, and, and I share that truth with many people, and there's some people really close to me who when I share that truth with them, they will agree, but then they will say, but we still have to confess our sins. And... Amazingly, this teaching comes from one verse in the Bible, 1 John 1, 9. And amazingly, I've never taught on that verse. Um, it's always kind of been a thorn in my side, and I've not really known how to explain it or teach it. 
And it was something just a few months ago, God just really, um, he just taught me a lot about it. So what I actually want to do today is I just want to break down 1 John 1, 9. That is what we're going to do this entire message. We're, we're, we're going to go to many places in the Word, but it's all going to be to give you a, a thorough and correct understanding of 1 John 1, 9. Now, I have many good friends. Um, I was actually sharing with Keisha before I recorded this. I was like, this isn't really how our camp uh, sees this verse. And, um, you know, that's okay. I have really good friends who I've, I've asked them their opinion on this verse, and it is completely different than the way I see it. So what I want to do today is I just want to lay out all the evidence that I have for believing uh, what I believe about 1 John 1, 9. And let me say up front, what I believe about 1 John 1, 9 is I believe that 1 John 1, 9 is simply referring to unbelievers. I do not believe it's referring to a to a Christian, to one who is born again, but it is it is speaking of unbelievers and their need to realize they are sinners in need of a savior. Okay, so um, but let's start. Let's go to First John five thirteen before we go to First John one. Let's go to First John five thirteen because I believe this is very important to see before uh, you can understand anything in 1st John the entire book. So uh, let's look at 1st John 5 13. It says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Now he, notice he said, These things have I written. This is going to be important later on. So this is the last chapter, uh, one of the last few verses of 1st John 5. So he says, These things have I written. So he's referring to everything he's written before this has, has had this purpose in mind that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So John here tells us, hey, this whole epistle I've written unto you, there are two uh, points to it. There are two reasons I've written this epistle unto you. And that is one, that you may know that you have eternal life. This is why this is eye-opening. Um, 1 John is one of those books in the New Testament that seems to really give us grace preachers a hard time. It's used a lot to make people doubt their salvation. Um, thinking of another verse, I think it's 1 John 3, 9. Uh, 1 John 3 as a whole, it can, it can really give us some problems. And, and the, the importance in understanding 1 John 3, if you want to go study it for another time, I'm not going to get into that, is you really need to understand spirit, soul, and body. But let's get back to our main point. If you read the book of 1 John and you finish that book or you read a verse in that book and it makes you doubt your salvation, you have misinterpreted something. Because the entire point of this book is to secure you in your salvation, to secure you in your identity. And then he says, so that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. The New King James Version says that you may continue to believe. Now the word, now we think of name, and that, that's, that's, it's became so cliche, but we just think it's something in the name of Jesus that we tack onto the end of a prayer. But when you're, you're using someone's name, you're using their authority. So whenever we're, we're, Jesus told us to pray in his name or to believe on his name, he's actually referring to his work, his finished work. So the book of 1 John has two purposes. One, so that you can be secure in your salvation in Christ. And two, so that you can continue to rely on his finished work. And that's so important because so many people read 1 John and they don't continue in the finished work. They actually get into self-righteousness. They get into dead works like we're referring to with 1 John 1, 9. So let, let's go over to 1 John 1, 9. And real quick, I'm just going to read this once uh, right now. It says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, before we get started really breaking this verse down, um, I think it's important to know John's audience because your audience determines where you start when you're ministering, you're writing, you know, just in a conversation. Your audience determines where you begin. And um, I, I can relate to this big time. Now, some people have, have took this and they've abused it 
and they said, you know, we can't understand any of the Bible unless we understand the first century and the audience. And I'm not of that persuasion. I think the Holy Ghost, uh, he's the one who wrote this book and he is the one who can reveal it to us. But it certainly helps to know some background. And, and so I can relate to this because there was a year or two in my life uh, in my ministry where I would actually uh, preach on Saturday nights at a Pentecostal charismatic church and then on Sunday mornings I would preach at a Baptist church and usually I would preach the same message to, to both congregations because they were completely different uh, rarely would someone be at that Saturday night service that would be at that Sunday morning service um, but they were two completely different audiences with two completely different sets of beliefs. And I'm just gonna give an example. I never did this, because I'm not stupid. <laughs> but uh, um, let's say I could go back in time, or, or I was still doing that today. Let's say I was still doing that today. Saturday night, I'm preaching at a Pentecostal church. Sunday morning, I'm gonna preach at a Baptist church. And let's say for two months, I decided one month, I'm gonna do a series on eternal security, okay? That, that a believer cannot lose their salvation. And then let's say the next month I decided now I'm going to do a series on the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Okay, so if I began with eternal security and I began that series on eternal security, how many of those on Saturday nights at that Pentecostal church, I would have to begin laying a foundation. I would not be able to just get into it because as a whole... Uh, those kinds of churches, those denominations do not believe in eternal security. They believe any sin can cause you to lose your salvation for the most part. So I would have to spend a lot of time laying groundwork. So where I began would be much different, whereas on Sunday mornings in a Baptist church, I could go right into taking them deeper into the truth of eternal security and taking them more deeper into how that truth can impact their life right now. Okay, so the audience would make a big difference in where I began. Same with if I did a series on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. With Pentecostal churches, I know that's an anchor of that denomination. So I, I could just go in and immediately begin on why tongues is important and, and et cetera, et cetera. But with a Baptist church, I would have to start from scratch. I would have to show that there's a difference between initial salvation experience and the feeling of the Holy Spirit. So your audience determines where you begin. And that's very important when we're talking about the very first chapter of an epistle in the New Testament. So let's let's see who John's primary audience was. And uh, I can relate to this too because, um, you know, I'm a person who primarily I teach to the body of Christ. And I know some people, they're not good at teaching to the body of Christ. That they, they mostly minister to unbelievers. And even though I occasionally minister to unbelievers, my primary audience is the church, the body of Christ. So the same with John. Let, let's look at who his primary audience was. This is Paul speaking. He says, And when James, Cephas, or that's Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen or the Gentiles and they unto the circumcision or the Jews. So John's primary audience was the Jews. And that, that's what Paul says. He's like, my primary audience is Gentiles, those who have never heard the law, those who don't know anything about the temple and its sacrifices, those who don't know anything about the Old Testament, but, but those who are... Gentiles who are primarily in heathen religions, um, just, just unbelievers who, who don't have a, we would say, a past with the church is the way we'd look, we would look at that today. So John's primary audience was Jews, James, uh, uh, James, John, and Peter. So John's primary audience was the Jews. And we actually see that with the very first verse of 1 John when he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. And why, why did he start out speaking that way? Because in the Jewish church, and I, I, I'm using that term loosely, I'm just from referring to that sect of the church, which was primarily Jews. In that section of the church, 
a group had infiltrated it who were known as the Gnostics. And the Gnostics denied that Jesus actually came in the flesh. That's why if you read John's epistles, you see him really emphasizing that Jesus was a man. Um, he never denies his deity. He very much so um, uh, believed in Jesus, the, the deity of Jesus, especially when you read the gospel according to John. But in his epistles, he really hammers home the truth that Jesus was a man. And the reason is because the Gnostics didn't believe he was a man. They said he was just, you know, he was spirit who made himself appear as a man. So we see right away just the fact the way John uh, begins this letter that he's, 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 he's hitting a group who has infiltrated the Jewish church who, who have some um, false doctrine, okay? So, so it's important to know that that that. that John's primary audience was Jews. Why is that important? Um, that's important because Jews, it was a big part of the old covenant to confess sins for forgiveness. And a lot of people look over that and they only see that as a New Testament uh, doctrine. And they believe that in the Old Testament, it was just as simple as you, you know, you, 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 you sinned and then you offered an animal sacrifice. But I, I want to look at a few verses in in the in the old covenant that established this point that John's hearers primarily Jewish believers or unbelievers would have been um, anchored in this idea of confessing sins for forgiveness so look at Leviticus 5 uh, verses 5 through 6 it says and it shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these things uh, referring to the person who sins, that he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing. And he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord for his sin which he has sinned, a female from the flock, a lamb or a kid of the goats for a sin offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his sin. So notice the pattern. The, the, the sinner, the one who is guilty, come, came to the priest with an offering, he confessed his sin, and then blood was shed. And that's kind of what people believe under the New Covenant. They think that the guilty person confesses their sin to God, and then they get that sin back under the blood, and they're forgiven. Okay, so that's an Old Covenant doctrine. Look at Numbers, Numbers chapter 5, verses 5 through 7. We're just going to read a few of these, and I wrote down about 10, but we're only going to look at 3 or 4. Okay, Numbers 5, verses 5 through 7. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel. When a man or woman shall commit any sin that men commit to do a trespass against the Lord, and that person be guilty, then they shall confess their sin which they have done, and he shall recompense his trespass with the principle thereof. And our smart. So again, we see that it was a, a old covenant, a part of the old covenant economy for forgiveness to confess your sin. And then one more in Psalm 32 and verse 5. It reads, this is David speaking, I acknowledged my sin unto you, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So David just, again, he's kind of summarizing the old covenant economy, which was, I confess my sins and get my sin under blood to be forgiven. And that's very much how people see it under the new covenant. And just one more witness, and this is a little different. This is speaking of the ministry of John the Baptist in Mark 1, 4, and 5. He says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea, they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. And here's something I find powerful about this, because there's many who still believe this is the case with baptism today, or forgiveness under the new covenant today, confessing baptism, etc. Something I find interesting, if you go to Acts chapter 19, and for sake of time, we won't go there, verses 1 through 5, when Paul comes up to him, he's like, where, you know, have you been, have you received the Holy Ghost? And they say, we don't even know if there is such a thing as the Holy Ghost. He says, what, what were you baptized then? And they say, John's baptism. And I find it interesting, if things were the same under the new covenant as they were then, Paul would have said, okay, that's good. You confessed your sin, you were baptized to be forgiven of your sins, you're good. 
But he said, no, okay, you've got to be back. You've got to do it the new covenant way, essentially, in my own words. Uh, so right there we see that this isn't the new covenant model um, today. So, so we see the old covenant was very much, the old covenant economy involved the confession of sins for forgiveness. Okay, so, so we, we, we see that. That's important to know. And it would have been a smart it would have been a smart way for for John to begin his letter uh, teaching this. Okay, so let's break down the way this is usually seen. If we confess our sins, and what I'm actually about to share with you is was kind of the the light that shined on this verse for me, and just kind of told me the way that I had been believing it was totally false. Um, and something I was going to share. Uh, the 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 revelation that I received that that kind of freed me from the daily confession of sins. And before you cast stones, don't worry. I am going to to share in a minute how there is a time to confess sins, and we'll we'll get into that. But uh, this guy that was really that really opened my eyes to the new covenant and grace. He used the example. And he said, confessing your sins every day or every night is a lot like every day asking your wife. Say you go to bed every night because that's when I would, when I confess my sins. Every night I'd go to bed and I'd confess my sins. Ask God to forgive me. Um, say I went to bed every night. Keisha and I went to bed. And every night I was like, baby, will you marry me? You know, and the first time she might think that's sweet. Oh, of course I will. Next night we go to bed. Baby, will you marry me? Again, it's a little sweet, but okay. Third night, I do it again. Will you marry me? You know what? She's eventually, if I do this every night, eventually she's going to say, what's wrong with you? Do you not realize that we're already married? That we're in a relationship? Are you okay? Have you forgotten something? And that opened my eyes because I realized we're already forgiven. And now I'm just free to enjoy relationship with the Father, Okay. I hope that that helps you. I don't think I quite got it across as he did. But, okay, so verse 9, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins. Now, if you ask the, the, the typical uh, minister or believer, what's this saying? What sins? That's what I want you to ask yourself right now. What sins is this referring to? Most ministers would say it's the sins you commit. It's it's the the if you lied that day you need to confess it. If you committed adultery that day you need to confess it. If you lost your cool that day you need to confess it. It's our individual actions of sin, is what most people describe this as. But here's the fascinating thing: when John says sins here, it's hamartia, and I, I could be pronouncing that wrong, but it's uh, it's not a verb. A verb, if he was talking about our individual sins, here he would have said, he would have used a verb because it's our actions. It's that which we do. But he didn't use a verb referring to actions, but he actually used the word sins referring to a noun, which is indicating, uh, or, or it's, it's referring to our nature or a nature. Um, and when you look up this word in vines, and I've got an entire message that's available on, on the church's YouTube channel or, or the podcast. And I think they titled it, Do We Consider Ourselves Sinners by Grace, Saved by Grace. Um, one time I sat down and, uh, you know, because we're not sinners saved by grace. We were sinners and now we've been saved by grace through faith. But um, I thought, you know, I can come up with four or five verses off the top of my head that prove that we're not sinners saved by grace because I hear that a lot even out here in Colorado at that school. I hear that a lot. Um, and when I ended up sitting down, I ended up coming up with over 60 verses that I share in that message that prove that point. But um, So this word sins, um, in the Vines Dictionary, listen at the definition. It says, it's a principle or source of action. This is the word sins. Inward element producing acts. Not the acts, but the inward element that produces those acts. And the third definition, this is the one I prefer, a governing principle or power. 
Okay, so it's not referring to those actions of sin, but a sin nature that every human being comes into this world is born with. Okay, so he's talking about a sin nature. Okay, well, let's go to Romans 6. And again, I've got that message that goes into much more detail on Romans 6. So I'm going to hit this really quick. So if he's referring to a sin nature, the sin that is a noun, let's see what the Apostle Paul taught about that sin nature and the believer's relationship to it. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? For God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin, that's the noun, live any longer therein? Verse 3, know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Verse 6, jump down to verse 6, knowing this, and when I teach this, I always say the reason so many believers live in sin is because they don't know this. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified, that the body of sin, that governing principle or action might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve that governing principle or source sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin, the noun. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we should believe that we shall also live with him. Again, knowing this, that Christ had been raised from the dead, died no more, death had no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin. That's the noun, the governing principle or source. Once, but in that he lives, he lives unto God. Likewise, reckon you yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, that governing principle but alive unto God through our through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what Paul taught was that, and I believe John would have agreed with him, why would, so let's look at it. Paul taught that believers, yeah, everyone's born with a sin nature. But when you get born again, that sin, that governing principle or power, it died. It no longer rules you. It's no longer, you are freed from it, is what he said. So John, knowing this truth, because Paul said in Galatians that John perceived the grace that was given unto him. In other words, John agreed with it. Okay, so why would, if John knew this truth, why would John say, okay, you're dead to your sin nature, you no longer have a sin nature, it does not rule you anymore, you're free from it, live free. Okay, so then why would he say, and you need to confess, because... Remember, sin here is not action, it's a noun. Why would you need to confess a sin nature as a believer if you're already dead to it, if you're already freed from it? There's no need, there's no reason to confess something that is dead. Okay, there's no need to confess something that has no power over you. So this proves that John here is not referring to believers. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So let me ask, so, so what's he saying? Um, for, for you to admit you need a Savior, <laughs> or, or for you to receive a Savior, you, you first have to admit that you need a Savior. And if Jesus came to die for your sin, you must first admit that you have sin. So the Gnostics were of the uh, persuasion that we weren't sinners, that we weren't born sinners, um, that there was no sin nature. So, and here's the amazing thing. It, 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 it blows my mind that the church doesn't realize this because the church practices what I'm teaching today. Okay, so I'm saying that what John is saying here is for you to be a born-again believer, for you to get saved, you need to acknowledge that you are a sinner. Okay, the church practices that all the time, you know, any altar call I've been a part of, they want to lead you. They want you, they'll say, if they, they lead you in prayer, they will say, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. Okay, so they put this into practice. And what we learn as New Covenant believers is that then, from that moment on, that sin nature, it's gone. I don't confess that I'm a sinner anymore. I confess that I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Okay, so John is simply saying you need to admit that you were born a sinner, and as a sinner, you need a Savior. Okay, so 
you know, and, and now what I want to get to is uh, let's let's go to, to Hebrews chapter 9. So all John is saying there in summary is when we confess that we are sinners who need a Savior, he is more than glad to save us because he came to die for sinners. If you won't admit that you're a sinner, guess what? You don't qualify for saving, okay? So, um, so let's go now to Hebrews uh, chapter 9. And Hebrews and 1 John are a lot alike because they're written to the same audience. Um, John's primary audience was Jews. We've established that. So Hebrews was written to who? The Hebrews, the Jews. Um, so, so the audience is very much the same, and the purpose is the same. You cannot teach eternal security without going through the book of Hebrews. Uh, you cannot teach for someone to continue in the finished work of Christ, which we learned was the twofold purpose of 1 John, without going through the book of Hebrews. So let's look at New Covenant forgiveness. Is New Covenant forgiveness on a confession-to-confession confession basis? Okay, I'm going to hit this really quick, but I highly suggest if you struggle with this, if, and what I'm saying, you're like, I don't know about that, Hebrews 8, 9, and 10, read them, study them, meditate on them, and I promise you can't come away with a different answer other than what I'm about to teach you. Hebrews chapter 9, um, for, for sake of time, let, let's just jump down to verse 11. He says, But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal, this, this, this phrase is so important, guys, eternal redemption for us. Now, redemption is a loaded word. There is so much to the word redemption. There's been so much that's included in our redemption. But when we interpret Scripture with Scripture, um, we're given the, the definition to the word redemption in its most basic form and what I feel is its most powerful form. Okay, really quick, let's look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Okay. So remember what, what the author of Hebrews just said. The blood of Jesus obtained eternal redemption. Okay, Eph Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Sa exact, same, exact same thing there as in Hebrews. Now look here what he says redemption is. In case if, if the reader is like, wait, what's redemption? in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. One, one more witness. Y'all knew when they said I was ministering today that she's going to get a lot of word, right? Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness, even the forgiveness of sins. All right, so redemption in its most basic uh, its most basic definition, its most basic form, redemption is the forgiveness of sins. Okay, and here's what's powerful about that is that word right before redemption, eternal. If, if the forgiveness of sins is based on it, me confessing it, I only get forgiven when I confess it, then the author of Hebrews could have never said, my redemption, your redemption is eternal. Because then it would have only been momentary. It would have been based on a confession-to-confession confession basis. And also notice, all three of those verses teach us that, that redemption, the forgiveness of sins, comes through one means, the blood of Jesus. Okay, that is the, God's economy is not, the new, God's economy is blood. Okay, in America, we use dollars, we use cents. Okay, um, in God's economy, it's blood. Okay, and, and the good news is Jesus has already paid uh, for that. Let, let's keep reading here in Hebrews 9, verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience, conscience from dead works, and confession of sins for a lot of people like myself was a, is a dead work 
to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions or the forgiveness of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a test testator. Okay, and you can just keep reading here, guys. Verse 22, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. That's powerful. Because that tells me that if, if I have to confess my sins daily to be forgiven, each time I sin I have to go confess it, then the only way I can be forgiven for it is if Jesus sheds his blood again. That, that's the only way. Because it's not, notice he did not say, and without the confession of sins there is no remission. He said, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Okay, so so that, that's important to remember. Again, uh, guys, re read these whole chapters. Let's go to verse 10 really quick. I'm, I'm moving quick. Um, for the law having a shadow, 10 verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the com comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. So he's, he's making a, a, a powerful point here. He's saying if there was a sacrifice under the old covenant that could have perfected uh, the, those who were offering them, they would have stopped offering them. Okay, now, now this is powerful because in Hebrews 10 verse 14, he says, but for by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. That's us. That's new covenant believers. Okay? In other words, Jesus' sacrifice once made us perfect. He has no need to offer his blood again. Why? The only conclusion is because he has forgiven us of all sins, past, present, and future. And I, I'm going to establish a point with in First John in that. But real quick, I just want to make this point. Because, verse 2, because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. Guys, when I was focusing on confessing my sins daily and I was, you know, taking notes of, hey, what sin did I commit so I know to confess it? Um, when I was doing that, I was sin conscience. I was always focused on my sin. And even, so when I went to God with a need, the first thing I thought of wasn't the supply that God's gra of God's grace, the first thing I thought of was, now what sins have I committed that I first need to get forgiven for? I was not Jesus conscious. I was not righteousness conscious. I was sin conscious, okay? Verse 3, but in those sacrifices, there's a remembrance again made of sins every year. Guys, for a lot of us, the sacrifices we offer are not the blood of bulls and goats, but it is the confession of sins for forgiveness. That's the sacrifice that uh, many of us offer, okay? And the good news is we've been washed, we've been cleansed, we've been perfected. Um, we have no need to offer any more sacrifices. Praise God. In verse 4, For it is impossible, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Okay, and then really quick, uh, verse, verse 10 of Hebrews 10, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And, and some will say that's once for all people. But keep reading. Verse 11, and let's look at context. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. So the context is sins, not people. Verse 12 but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, eternal redemption, sat down on the right hand of God. Verse 14, for by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Man, praise God, we are forgiven uh, past, present, and future. And the word remission, it's so powerful. The word remission means forgiveness or pardon of sins. But here's what I like. Letting them go as if they had never been committed. So if that's what remission is, and the blood of Jesus has given us remission of all sins, then why would John come along and say, you know what, if, if remission means to, to, to take it away as if it never happened, why would John come along and say, and you need to confess that they're there? 
he wouldn't. It just it just doesn't line up. So my conclusion of First John one nine is that John is simply saying, confess that you're a sinner who needs a savior. That qualifies you, and when you do, I can promise that you will receive that Savior, you will receive the forgiveness of all your sins, and you will be cleansed from all righteousness forever throughout eternity to only be known as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, never to be known as a sinner again. Amen. Isn't that good news? That's awesome. And uh, so before we, we wrap up, uh, I know there's, there's I, I shared a, the, the book that changed my life, I, I shared it with a good friend one time, and a few days later, he, he consumed it, and he got up with me like two days later. And he's like, I have one problem with this book. And I was like, oh, you know, I, I knew what it was going to be. And he said, I don't like that this dude's saying we don't have to confess our sins. I, I, I need to confess my sins. And I, am, I believe that there is a healthy place for confession of sins. Now, let me say this. I'm against confession of sins for forgiveness for the believer. Uh, the blood of Jesus is the only thing that can take away sins. But something powerful happens when we confess our sins and our faults to one another. Many times confessing our, our, our sins releases the healing that is in our spirits out into our souls, our mind, will, and emotions, and in our body. I believe we see this in James 5 when he talks about confessing your faults one to another that you may be healed. So I, I think there's healing that takes place inside the body when, when we share our weaknesses with one another. Um, guys, something I found that is so powerful, used to, I used to be um, kind of bashful about my testimony and my previous sins. And now that I know that Jesus has forgiven me of all my sins, past, present, and future, I have learned, we, we, Keisha and I have shared a testimony with so many people out here, a testimony that at one time we, we was ashamed to share of our sin and, 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 and our, our weakness. And when we've shared it out here, we, we've seen people, you know, just powerfully, you know, that they'll, they'll just begin crying and weeping and then begin to share with us their weaknesses. And, and, and we just, we've just seen uh, the power of God flow through a testimony and through, you could say, that is confessing our sin. And even though it's forgiving, we're sharing it with people and uh, people are getting freed through it. They're, they're getting, um, you know, they're getting healed. And I don't just mean through, I don't mean physically, but I mean something is released into their soul, into their mind, their will, and their emotions, and uh, just sets them on the right path. So I, I believe there, there is confession of sins, and it can be healthy, but not uh, for forgiveness, okay? That, that's not why we confess our sins. And we shouldn't, yeah, I, I think I've made that point. And, you know, if we want to look at confessing our sins, um... Let's look at the word. The word confess in the Greek, and I could be saying this wrong. I'm not a Greek scholar. Homologio. Um, and so the Greek definition of the word confess here in 1 John 1, 9 is to say the same thing as another. And most people will come along and they'll say, okay, this is saying that you need to agree with God that what you're doing is sin. Confess, God, I agree with you that this is sin. I'm sorry, forgive me. Okay, so they agree with me that the word means to say the same thing as. But they say it's to say the same thing as what God does about sin. And here's what I want to say. What does God say about the believer's sin? Your sins and your iniquities will I remember no more. That's powerful. If you're going to believer, if you're going to confess your sins, if you're going to say the same thing as God does about your sins, your only confession is that I've been forgiven of all of my sins. His sin, my sins and iniquities, he remembers no more. He's cast them as far as the east is from the west. I am redeemed. Okay, that is your confession of sins. Okay, and, and, and I think that is, um, and, and I think that's powerful. And uh, really quick, you know, as we, we wrap up, you know, I'm going to take a few minutes and, and just share a few nuggets really quick in the book of 1 John that I think back this, this up. Um, let's look at verse 8, okay? The, the verse right before verse 9, he says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. So let's say he's talking about believers. 
If a believer says he has no sin, he's deceiving himself. Okay, so if I'm confessing my sins when they're present, and John just said if there's ever a moment, if he's referring to believers, if there's ever a moment that you say you have no sin, then you're a deceiver. Guys, when can I stop confessing my sins? I can't. Because if John's referring to a believer, he's saying, hey, listen, you always have sin, so guess what? Keep confessing. Don't stop. And you know what that leads to? A sin conscience. And we've already read that we're not supposed to have a sin conscience. So when can we stop? He's referring to these people who, who you know, we come across people who say, I'm not a sinner, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a good person. And John's saying, listen, if you're saying that you're not a sinner, if you're saying that you weren't born with a sin nature, that you weren't born into sin, you're deceiving yourselves. And if you're deceived, you can't, be, you, you can't receive the salvation that's been provided for you. That, that's what he's saying. And the truth is not in us. Okay? That's another reason this has to be referring to unbelievers because we have the truth in us. Okay? John, I, I highly recommend you look at 1 John 2 and verse 20 and 27. The truth is in the believers, okay? Um, verse. So let's just read on. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Why do we make him a liar? Because here was God's redemptive plan that he was going to send his son to die for our sins that kept us from fellowship with the Father. So if Jesus' mission was to come to die for our sins and we say, yeah, but I don't have any sins, you're calling the Son of God, the, the Father, you're calling them liars, okay? You're saying God is a liar. That's what you're saying. So that just makes perfect sense, guys. That's the only way I think you can read 1 John 1. And, and make sense, okay? So let's go to 1 John 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write out unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So the people who disagree with me and say that 1 John, is written to, 1 John 1 is written to believers They'll go to verse two, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, and, and try to prove their point. My little children, these things write I unto you. And I say, see, he's referring to these things that he just wrote unto them. I don't think that's accurate. Because why wouldn't he have said, look at 1 John 5, 13. We've already read it. He said, these things have I written unto you. Past tense. So he's referring to, his, you know, to what he's just previously written. But here John says, my little children, these things write I unto you. I believe that he's referring to what's to come, what he's about to write, not what he has just written. I think here in 1 John 2, verse 1, he's changing the audience. He's saying, okay, I've, in, I've addressed these unbelievers, these Gnostics. Now I want to talk to you, my little children, the beloved in Christ, those who are born again. And, and, and read uh, 2 John 1, the elder unto the elect lady and her children. Okay, so... Uh, 3 John uh, 1, down in verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. So it's, he always refers, John's thing was he always referred to believers as children. So I believe 1 John 2, 1, he changes the audience. So he's saying up here, hey guys, if you, you need to admit that you're a sinner, you know, be born again. We went into all that. And then verse 2, he says, listen, and believers, if you sin, guess what? You have an advocate. He's forgiven you of all of your sins, and you need to know that. So um, I, I, I just think this is what makes the most sense. I can't answer everything in 1 John. There are still some problems I have, but uh, this is what I think makes the most sense. Now, we're, we're going to cover one more verse, and then I'm, I'm finished. Um, 1 John 2, 12. And I, I did a whole Sunday school um, class, if you remember, a year or two ago on this verse. Um, this 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 settles it for me. Okay, First John two twelve. I write unto you, little children. And then when you when you look up that in the Greek, he's he, he's in these verses he's referring to three classes of believers. And little children in the Greek here is actually referring to though to infants, those who have just been born again, 
those who, who aren't deep in the faith, uh, they're, they're probably not so strong in the faith just yet. And what he's saying is, look here, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Okay, remember, his name refers to his finished work. So your sins are forgiven you for his finished work's sake, not your confession of sin's sake. But anyways, um, I write on you little children. So he's saying this, what I'm about to teach you about forgiveness, you should know this immediately upon being saved. Okay, and I spent like, I guess, ten, you know, almost 10 years of my Christian walk not knowing this. And this should be what we teach new believers immediately, okay? So, I write on you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Now, this word forgiven gets extremely interesting in the Greek. Not with definition, but with tense and voice, okay? It's written in the passive voice, which means you had nothing to do with it. So if it was my confession of sins that forgave, that forgave me, then it should be in the active voice because I had something to do with it. But it's in the passive voice, which means um, it wasn't me. I just received it. Um, the, the example you often see, like if you look at a website like Blue Letter Bible, it'll say the example is the boy was hit by the ball. Uh, he, he didn't throw the ball at himself. He was just the one who received the hit. Okay? So, and here's where it gets really interesting. The tense is perfect. Now, in the English, we, we don't have anything that, that meets the qualifications and that can be compared to the perfect tense. Perfect tense, listen to this, describes an action which is viewed as having been completed in the past once for all, not needing to be repeated. So according to John, he's saying here, the first thing you need to know as a believer is that you have been forgiven perfectly. It, your forgiveness was completed in the past on the cross through the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus once for all, not needing to be repeated. And he would not have been able to... That forgiveness, if it's the way most of the church sees it, that it's only when we confess it and get for, you know and receive forgiveness that way then it was, should have been in the present tense because it was an ongoing thing. But, uh, guys, we are forgiven past, present, and future. We are perfectly forgiven. We are perfectly redeemed, and that is good news. That's the gospel. Amen. So I hope this has blessed you today. Uh, it's, it's blessed me sharing it. Uh, I love you guys so much, you know, and I just want to say that again. I'm so thankful for you, and uh, I love you, and uh, hopefully we're going to see you really soon. I hope to see you much sooner than you expect, um, but Grace Point is our family, and uh, guys, so just I just want to finish by saying know that you're forgiven, and uh, as Jeremiah ministers this series, I I'm going to assume he's going to be continuing after this message. I, I could be wrong, but... Um, even not, even if not, he's been ministering it. Evaluate your lives and look and look for dead works, a dead work that you're performing. And remember what I said: a dead work is it's that it's an action which you try, which you perform to atone for sin or to make things right with God. And if if you find that, if you discover a dead work in your life and you toss it out, and again, tossing it out doesn't mean that I don't do it any, you know, I never do it. It just means I, I put it in its right place, you know, like we're talking here with confession of sin. And when you do that, I'm telling you, you are on the road to a condemnation-free life. And uh, I'm telling you, there is, there is no life like that. Amen. So, guys, I just want to pray for you. Father, I thank you for Grace Point Church. Lord, I just speak blessing over them this morning. Father, I believe that that the best is yet to come for them. Lord, you're releasing uh, gifts supernaturally to people. You're, you're, you're showing them their giftings. You're showing them, uh, Father, what they have in you, who they are in you. And uh, Lord, I just pray that a spirit of wisdom and revelation would, would rest upon Grace Point Church. And uh, Lord, I just I just speak blessing over them, blessing in their souls, their mind, their will, and their emotions, blessing in their bodies and their physical health. I speak healing to each and everybody there. Any symptom 
uh, anything in their bodies that does not line up with the word of God that says by the stripes of Jesus they have been healed, I command it right now in Jesus' name to line up with the word and the promises of God. So Father, I thank you for them. I release them from condemnation right now. Anyone who has been struggling with condemnation, Father, I, I pray right now that you would reveal to them the source of that and show them how to go forward without condemnation and to get that thing out of their life and how to, to properly use it in their life if need be. And uh, I just thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen. So guys, I love you. I hope this has been a blessing to you. And uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Jeremiah Stacy, for the opportunity. And uh, I'm sure Tim's beard's looking good. I, I, I can just tell that Tim's beard's looking real good. So, uh, guys, I love you and uh, blessings.